Well, thank you so much for your introduction. And I want to thank the organizers for this wonderful conference, first of all, for inviting me, but also for bringing such a nice group of people together. It's really, really nice to see familiar faces, but it's also really, really nice to see new directions and of the results we have in control theory. And my, my talk is a bit along these lines, and I, I would like to apologize first for this rather technical title, because the story I would like to tell is rather simple, I see. And it touches a bit on what what Vince Isaac said, I think it was yesterday, that can we actually use control theoretic tools to inform whole quantum algorithms rather than just improving gate for them? That's basically the story of this talk. And I'm going to argue that, well, instead of optimizing over control functions or parameters, we optimize directly over, over gates or circuits to carry out an algorithm. And what you see here in the back, even though it's a little bit faint, is uh, the mountains in Phoenix, the Four Peaks Mountains, which I used to hike. So, so my optimization landscapes will basically these mountains. I know it's a, it's a very simplification, because in fact, optimization landscapes are typically smooth, and these mountains are pretty rugged. However, I use that as an analogy to explain how we can hike to the top of the mountain, which then in the end corresponds to solving an optimization problem. Or an, an quantum algorithm setting, which corresponds to solving a computationally challenging problem. And first, I would like to start with how I actually got into the field, because my background is quantum control theory, but I moved a bit more into quantum algorithm design. And what caught my attention was the development of circuit variation of quantum algorithm. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, I recommend this review article by Zarenzo et al., where they describe very well what these variational algorithms are. So on a very, very high level, what you have is, well, you have a quantum device that basically calculates the cost function that tells you how far away you are to a solution to a computationally challenging problem. Then you hook up that quantum device to a classic computer, and you solve the optimization problem in this iterative loop. So how does the, the quantum device calculate this cost function? So typically what you do, you write down a quantum circuit, you parameterize these gates, and then you optimize over the gates or the angles, the parameterization of your quantum circuit to solve your problem in this iterative fashion. So first, you read out the cost function. You feed that back into a classical computer. You use a classical algorithm. And then you iterate, hopefully, finding the solution to your computational problem. And it is interesting if you see that optimization loop. Well, it is very, very really familiar to you because we have the same loop in quantum optimal control. And we emphasize that back in 2021 in this perspective article that if you do optimal control at the pulse level, where you optimize over pulses, it's the same thing as doing on the circuit level. Um, notice, by the way, the number for our paper, which I was very happy about. Um, but if you take this perspective, it's interesting because on that level, we can apply all the control theoretic cues we have. We could use Lie algebras to determine whether actually the problem solution is feasible. We could use parameterization of control pulses to actually find the optimal solution. So Ilya talked a lot about that piecewise constant versus other parameterizations makes a huge difference. We could also apply the Pontryagin maximum principle to find or characterize these solutions to a computationally challenging problem. So over the last years, people have actually adopted these tools and brought them from this side to this side and vice versa. I got interested in that because I started out on this side, right? Finding pulses to solve control problems and characterizing the solution. But then I realized it's actually easier here on that side because you could think of that as basically a digital model, whereas this is a bit analog. Think of classic computing. Analog, continuous pulses, digital zero points. I think that paradigm is quite nice because it allows us to use the whole stack of control tools to solve computational problems. But of course, as we learned, it depends strongly on how you parameterize your circuits or your pulse. And in the end, the challenge still remains, how do you actually find the controls that solve your problem? And in the end, what you actually have to solve is a non-convex problem in the end. So typically, the problem these, these algorithms, A on that level or on that level, try to solve is non-convex. What that implies is that you have local optima. So if you go back to our mountain analogy, um, so if you want to climb, say, to the tallest peak, which is the global optimum, well, there could be local optima to which you approach. So if you want to find the problem solution, you end up here. Well, you don't know how good these solutions actually are. So what that means is there is no solution guarantee. 
even though I like this paradigm a lot because we know these, these things from control theory, but we cannot guarantee that we actually find the solution. How do we actually design circuits that allows us to get here? The length of the circuit plays a role. On that level, the length of the pulse plays a role. The control function itself plays a role. There is a lot that we need to decide a priori to solve the problem. And that is really, really challenging. So the question is, how do we actually design Ansätze? And by Ansätze, I mean good guesses, either on that level or on that level, that solve the problem. This is really, really challenging. Because controllability can decide that a solution exists, but we don't know how long the pulses need to be. On top of that, we need to solve this optimization. So I want to address this issue by arguing that instead of fixing my control pulse or my circuit, I adaptively build up the circuit. That has the advantage that I don't have to care about a priori design choices. And first, I want to argue, well, how do you actually find these answers? And when I mean actually good, what I mean by good, good, good could mean a lot, right? Uh, what I actually mean by that is ansatz that allows us to efficiently converge to the global block. Idiom, that is, a, that is asking for a lot. Uh, it turns out there's one simple condition that I can write down that characterizes exactly what I mean, and I'm going to make that precise. Well, then it will turn out satisfying this condition is a bit challenging, and I have actually no idea how to do that. And in fact, I argue, I will argue, that it might be even not possible ever to satisfy this condition. So instead of looking at this condition, I then move on to the so-called adaptive point of argument, which is, in some sense, a form of adaptive control. In fact, several algorithms use Lyapunov-type ideas to design these algorithms. Nevertheless, these algorithms face the same challenges as variational quantum. They can get stuck in suboptimal solutions. I go on and say, OK, we know that stochastic grain descent algorithms work quite well. I use this paradigm with this idea to inform these adaptive algorithms to randomize them. And we're going to prove that this gives us convergence. In fact, I should say, I did not prove that because I then resorted to the gurus and the Romanian grain for Thomas Schulte Herbergen. Emmanuel Mavetti and Good Dadia, who is, I guess, online. Not 100% sure about that. So the real mathematicians were able to prove that. Um, bottom line message is, though, that randomization on that level helps to obtain convergence guarantee. Finally, I then identify these algorithms as gradient flows or variants of gradient flows, which again shows that these control theoretic tools that come from dynamical system theory are extremely useful to design quantum for a point. All right. Um, let me just directly jump into it with the first. So what I'm going to look at today is on so-called ground state problem. So what we have is an expectation value of that form. HP is some Hamiltonian that encodes the, the problem we want to solve. That could be a chemical Hamiltonian. That could be something else. For example, in combinatorial optimization, we typically pick HP to be an Ising type Hamiltonian, whose ground state correspond to the solution of the problem. The goal is now to prepare the state psi of theta that minimizes j. So we aim to solve, we aim to find the global minimum of g of theta over these classical parameters theta, and we use some sort of unitary transformation to create that state psi of theta that depends on these parameters. At this point, I don't want to make any assumption how these parameters theta enter in you. That could be parameterization of pulses, that could be gate parameters. At this point, I don't want to make any assumption. I want to see how far I get. Again, keep in mind, we want to solve this problem. So how does it work? Well, we measure the expectation value in each adaptive step of the Hamiltonian with respect to that state. We feed the cost function value into the class computer, and we iterate and iterate and iterate, until hopefully we end up here and not here. Well, again, how do we guarantee that we end up here and not here? given that we have global optimization. Let's take a first look of how this landscape actually looks like. Again, when I, when I, when I draw this picture, it's pretty rapid, right? And of course, in, in, a, in an observation, you don't have these cacti, right? But the point is that we want to climb to this mountain. So how do we do that? The first thing we notice is that the cost function is basically composition. It maps the parameters theta into the unitaries that live in a special unitary group of dimension d. For a qubit system, d is typically exponential, 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits. And then the unitary, u, maps the whole thing through this cost function onto the real line, or cost function value. 
Now, if you see a composition, even in high school, what do you do if you want to calculate derivatives? Well, you use the chain rule, right? And you can actually do that here too. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated because what is the derivative of j of u with respect to unity transformation? That's a little bit tricky, but you can define that, right? That's where we enter the Riemannian setting. But at this point, I just want to say, we could calculate the derivative using the chain rule, and we end up with something like that. So if you take the derivative of j with respect to one of these parameters, theta, what you see is you get an inner product, that is our composition. That inner product is the Hilbert Schmidt inner product, which is the trace of a dagger b. du by d theta is just the derivative of our, our, our answer c of theta with respect to theta. Rat j is the so-called Riemannian gradient. So for those of you who are not familiar with Riemannian geometry, just think of Rat j as the gradient of j as a function of u with respect to u. Again, I'm learning these concepts myself. For now, just think of these two things as vectors. And the mathematicians like to draw pictures like that. So what you see here is the tangent space of the special unitary group. We have a point u of theta at that point we have a vector of rat j, and we have a vector u by d theta j. Again, the precise mathematical definition, it might be a little bit challenging to write down, and not everyone is familiar. Just think of two vectors, because that helps a lot. Because now we see, when is this gradient zero? Well, we have two options here, right? First option is that rat j in itself is zero. That happens when the problem Hamiltonian commutes with the state psi, with a projector for example, for an eigenstate of h. But the second case is if the, the u to uh, uh, derivative by the theta j is orthogonal to grad j. So that's why this geometric picture helps a lot. That allows us to characterize the critical points. So let's make some assumption. Let's rule out the case that this guy is orthogonal to grad j. So if you assume that this whole thing spans the whole space, namely SUD, the special unitary algebra of dimension D. Uh, I should precise here, what I'm not writing here is, by the way, the point U at which we look at, which is, it doesn't really matter because obviously this, this inner product is invariant under this unitary transformation. So for the people who wonder, is there not a U missing here? Yes, there technically is, but it doesn't matter because it goes away. What that just means is if these vectors, so to say, span the whole space, it is impossible that this vector is orthogonal. So the critical points are determined by JFU. E. What that means is we could just focus on when this commutator becomes zero. And that is very well known. Uh, I did my postdoc in a group of first order bits, and he spent his whole career in characterizing that. And in fact, I think he wrote down three conditions for the landscape to be nice. And I can boil it down here now to one, which we call local city. On top of that, and that goes actually back to a work by Sophie Schirmer, uh, you can show that the critical points are global optima and subtle points only, with the little caveat that the subtle points are nice in the sense that they always exist one direction which is negative. And these subtle points are called strict subtle. Why is that important? It is important because you can show, well, in the classical machine learning uh, uh, literature, people have shown this, that you never hit these points. If you ever ask yourself why your brain algorithms converge so well, if you have enough parameters and you see now what enough means, right? You need at least d squared minus one. Then you can prove if this condition is satisfied that you never hit these three subtle points. And what that implies is that if you pick a random initial point, that you converge to the global optimum, the global minimum, which is given by the grounds. Notice though, this is a pretty strong statement. Notice that I did not give a reference there because I haven't published it yet. Even though I know this results, well, for like almost two to three years now. Why did I not publish it? Well, I first need to argue, does this, is it actually possible to satisfy this condition? Does there exist a system, a unitary transformation, a control system, a circuit, whatever, for which this condition is satisfied? And we looked at that, and we looked at a very, very simple system called so-called IQP circuits, where every element of the circuit commutes with itself. And we showed that the landscape is trap-free. Well, that's at least what we thought. In fact, there's a mistake in this paper, a pretty substantial mistake. In fact, 
there's one condition that is not satisfied, and that's exactly the violation of that condition. So even in the setting where we write down a really, really, really simple circuit where every element mutually commutes, it's extremely challenging to prove that the landscape is trapped free because this condition is not set. Now I would actually argue that there are no systems that these conditions can ever be set. And I'm pretty sure a person in differential topology or whatever has probably a theorem from the 80s that, that proves this. I still haven't found a person who can either disprove it or give me an example of a system that satisfies it. But now it also becomes clear what I mean by good unsets, right? Good unsets means give me a system that satisfies that and I can prove conversion. But it also is clear we need at least d squared minus one parameters. For a qubit system, we need exponentially many. So it's not scalable. We cannot save these parameters on a class computer efficiently. Plus, we a priori you don't know how to write down this U, right? So instead of fixing the circuit, the answer, I'm going to argue it is much better to adaptively create your circuit one by one, very much like adaptive control. And there is nothing new. People have looked at that. And I think the first paper that looked at that is by Sophia Conner in, in 2019. It's very famous now. It's called Adapt BQE. But then other papers looked at that. So, Russell Alicia McGann et al. developed an algorithm called Falcon, which is basically based on Lyapunov control. And I put here the, the early paper by Sophie Schirmer from 2010, because the paper from 2022 uses exactly the same tools to inform an algorithm. Lyapunov control. OK, so how do these algorithms work? Well, what do you do is you adapt if you create a circuit. Now, how do you do that? Well, you start with some initial step sign naught. You create the circuit U, K. K is the variable that tells me how far we are in the adaptive steps. Then you add another gate, e to the minus i, t to k, h, k, to your previous gate, U, K. Question is now, of course, how do you do that? How do you add that gate to it? Well, you do that based on gradient measurement. So if this is your cost function, psi k is the state at the k iteration. We say at t equal to zero, we have our cost function at jk. Then we add this gate. We calculate the derivative, the derivative with respect to t k. We evaluate it at t at, uh, at equal to zero. Update the parameter t This is my learning rate. If we do that in this fashion, again, this is the gradient with respect to t evaluated at zero. If we do that, we see the next step to be jk plus one by this parameter. And if gamma is sufficiently small, we move down. You can think of that as a local, local crane to center. And gamma is just the learning rate, again, that ensures if you expand this in a Taylor type fashion, that this is. Uh, the circuit for that looks like that. I know some people are not really happy with this picture because it can be quite confusing. But for the control theory community, I, I put this picture because it shows nicely that it is some sort of adaptive control. What you do is you read out the gradient, this guy. Then you feed that back into the theta k here, and then you move. Notice that this is not real-time feedback, right? Because if you measure, you collapse the state. So you have to continue and repeat the measurements to get enough statistics to read out that gradient. That can be, for example, done either if you know this commutator, you just measure the corresponding poly operator, the expectation value of that, or you use some sort of finite difference or other rules for the, the up the parameter shift rules. Bottom line message is that you grow the circuit based on these gradient information. And that has exactly been done in this paper by McGann et al., which is called Falcon, to solve the max cut problem here for a free regular graph. Why a free regular graph? Because classically, that is NP hard. And you see nicely, if, if you don't have weights in this graph, so if your Ising chain has equal couplings, you converge nicely to the graphs. However, if you put weights on the graph, you do not converge. And you could ask the same question. Why do we get stuck? Because at this point, these algorithms are all heuristics. Nobody has proven yet that, that these things actually converge. I mean, here they're very lucky. And I was actually kind of stunned to see that, that it nicely converges for these, these this three regular graphs. But here, it does. So then we can resort to our geometric picture because we can identify, again, this expression as the Riemannian gradient projected onto a direction hk. 
Because what I haven't told you yet is, I haven't told you yet how to actually pick the HK here, right? And now we see immediately, when do we stop? Well, we stop either when grad J is zero or when the HK is orthogonal to grad J. So you better pick the HK in a way that you're not orthogonal to the Riemannian gradient. But how do you know that a priori? You don't know what grad J actually is. But what I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to argue that if you randomize these tangent space direction HK in each adaptive step, I'm going to argue that then you obtain convergence. So how is this? All right, so what I want to do, there are various ways of randomizing these HKs. What I'm going to do is I fix an emission operator H. I conjugate this operator with a higher random unity transformation VK to obtain my operator HK. And I repeat that in each adaptive step. If I do this, and we published that in 2023 in this paper, well, you could write down a circuit like that. So our H here could be just the generator of a local rotation, the poly X operator. Then I sandwich this with a VK and a VK dagger here, which is how random. I calculate the gradient, feed it back, and I keep going. So why does this lead to convergence? Well, keep in mind again, when does the search stop? The search stops when either grad J is zero or when this HK is orthogonal. Well, what are the odds? If, a pick, if you fix one vector and you pick the other vector at random, what are the odds that you hit a vector that these vectors are orthogonal? Well, in the d-dimensional space, of course, there's a d minus one dimensional subspace in which the vectors are all orthogonal one, but that subspace, the vectors that live in there, has measure zero. So the probability that you hit a vector that is orthogonal is zero. That's the first operation. So, but for almost all HK, but a set of measure zero, we have that the Riemannian gradient is not orthogonal. That's really, really nice because that means that the convergence is determined by J as a function of U. As I said before, J as a function of U only has strict saddle points. So we avoid them with probability one. We never hit them. And that was actually the intuition that I had in this paper, but I'm not a differential geometry person. I didn't know how to prove that. So that's when I reached out to Thomas, the, the guru in Riemannian gradient flows. And we finally, Emmanuel, right? Well, both. And Gunther, of course. Um, and we finally were able to prove this. And I give you here the informal version, which we recently put on the archive. I think it was on Tuesday. We could prove that with probably one, we will never hit these, um, these strict solid points, thereby converging to the ground state to our problem solution. And I shall say, actually, the result is much more general because it just holds for arbitrary Mossbach function. So I don't even need to assume that we have the strict solid points, just that the cost function has a certain structure. Uh, and I also shall say, I don't know how many lemmas are in this paper, but the result follows after lemma 16 or something like that. So it is a bit hidden in there, but it's beautiful math. Or if you're interested in it, I highly recommend reading this paper. I shall say I probably understand 50% of it. So uh, I'm still learning these concepts. Um, Let's see. Uh, the problem there is from a quantum information perspective, I, I need uniform randomness, right? I need to implement these far random unitary transformations VK. And that is a problem because in quantum computing, you typically cannot do that efficiently. You need a circuit that is exponentially deep. But we also proved that you can approximate these things with so called unitary two designs. And two designs can be implemented efficiently. Without going into detail what two designs are, I just want to say that if you sample the VKs from a two design, that can be efficiently implemented, namely with a circuit of depth that is polynomial in the number of qubits. And indeed, when you do some simulations, what you plot here is basically how well we can reach the ground state. I think for an eight qubit system, one corresponds to reaching the ground state perfectly. I compared the adaptive steps versus this approximation ratio. And you almost see no difference between sampling from a two design and a full hard random unity. The reason for that becomes soon clear because when you look at that, you may wonder, well, how, how long does it actually take to converge? How many adaptive steps do I need? Which in quantum information science is absolutely crucial because we, we want that the system or the thing is scalable, right? Because if the adaptive steps I need to converge to ground state scales exponentially with the number of qubits, what's the point? So 
The question is, how do, long does it take to converge? And that is very much related to the efficiency of these kind of arguments. And you can make some fairly simple arguments. So for example, you can use a Lifshitz kind of argument to lower bound the cost function change. And that lower bound is given basically by the spectral norm of the problem, Hamiltonian, so the largest eigenvalue. And the inner product again between the remaining gradient and the direction HK you move in. OK, well, if you have that lower bound, you can sum up all these delta JKs, right? And you actually get a bound for how many adaptive steps are needed. This constant just C depends on how close you are to the ground state. So it does not depend on the number of steps or the dimension. And what matters now is the smallest inner product between the remaining gradient and the direction. That determines how many adaptive steps you need. And for those of you who are familiar with adi adiabatic uh, ground state preparation, similar expressions appear um, when you have the spectral gap that determines the efficiency of an adiabatic algorithm. Well, that means, of course, if you can show that this thing does not vanish faster than a polynomial in the number of qubits n, you have an algorithm that efficiently can prepare the ground state, namely in polynomial time or in polynomial many adaptive steps. Well, the quantum information theorist probably jump because you can prove that there does not exist an algorithm that can prepare arbitrary ground state sufficient. In fact, ground state preparation is curing me hard. So how is it possible that this condition can be such? In fact, notice it is pretty useless what I wrote down here because it depends obviously on the path, right? From zero to m. It's very similar to the spectral gap argument, which also depends on the path. So we can't really calculate it. But where is it hidden? Where do we see that in, in the end we need exponentially many steps to do that? Well, we could calculate the expected value, right? So on average, how, how much do we move? Well, we have to take the average over these VKs. Well, we could calculate that and get something like that. So you get the variance of HP, the problem in respect to the state of psi k. But what is important is that it scales as one over two to the two n. So how far we move vanishes exponentially in the number of qubits. And if you look at that, what kind of expression that is, we notice that this is the variance of the gradient. The expectation value of the gradient is zero. It's straightforward to show. So this shows you how, how much the, the gradient spreads when you sample this VK. And for those of you who are familiar with that, is that looks a lot like a Bern plateau. So what is a Bern plateau? Um, for those of you not familiar with that, is so think about it this way. Say we start here in our optimization landscape, and you want to climb to the tallest map. And you see, if you start here, it's pretty flat. So assuming you're not running against one of these cacti, which would pretty hurt, well, you still cannot move because it's so flat here that you don't know what is up or what is down. Grand plateaus are, in my opinion, the biggest issue in variational quantum biology. The larger you make the space, the smaller the gradients become, such that at the end, you cannot decide anymore what is up and what is down. And I'm not going to argue I solved it. But you see that how fast you move with the complexity of this algorithm in itself depends on the scaling of the variance, which in the end, again, is related to Baron plateaus. And for those of you interested, there's one paper I know by Zorenzo et al, where they have examples that do not show Baron plateaus, which depends on the problem HP on the Hamiltonian. But I haven't fully understood why that is or what the intuition is. OK. Um, so the question is, though, this is actually really, really slow, right? Because we randomly move into the direction. Do not take the structure of the problem into account. The question is, can we speed up converged while maintaining the guarantees that we converge to ground? And we can actually do that. And the way we do that is now we identify these adaptive algorithms as remaining gradient flows. What is the remaining gradient flow? Well, it's just determined by the differential equation of that form. Here is, again, the remaining gradient. This is the relative of the unitary transformation of the And this has a long, long history in numerical optimization and so on. For those of you who are interested in it, because that's how I got into it, there's a really, really good book by Helmke and Moore. It's called Optimization and Dynamical System. But I think Thomas and collaborators brought that a bit into the 
into the quantum world. And it is actually really, really useful um, to, to look at these gradient flows because they, they're really, really general. Um, the first paper I know of that really used these gradient flows to make an algorithm is Vizima and Kitteron in 2023. But again, they could not show that these things can be. Now, if you look at this gradient flow, if you look at the solution, uh, particularly its discretized version, it takes this form. Again, gamma is, is the step size we use to discretize it, right? And this is basically our discretization step. Now, if you look at that, and remember how I defined adaptive quantum algorithms, we see now that our adaptive change is given by the full Riemannian gradient. Now, let's simply take that and apply it to a ground state problem. For example, finding the ground state of an Isaac chain. That's what I've done here. So what I plot here is how many adaptive steps I need to find the ground state for two types of Isaac chain. One is a chain, and we see this linear scaling here with the number of qubits. The other one is a complete graph, a graph where all qubits are connected. And you see that is a very distinct scaling. I would argue this is linear. Whereas this is polynomial. What that shows is that the gradient flow takes the problem structure into account. That is really, really nice. So because if you could implement this guy efficiently, we would have an efficient algorithm to find the ground state of a chain. Well, the chain is easy, right? We could just look at it up, down, up, down, up, down. That's the ground state. But for a complete graph, that is not so easy anymore. Still efficiently solvable. But my hope was looking at that, that the gradient flow takes the problem structure into account. Keep in mind, this randomization procedure did not. It was kind of the worst case scenario. But you're left with the problem. How do you implement this for gradient flow? Because typically, you need exponentially sized circuit. Well, what have we done before? We took basically one direction of this full remaining gradient, so direction IK, we sampled that at random, and then we moved. So, and then we measured this direction for this set. Well, to speed up the convergence, instead of taking one direction, we could just take a bunch. Say we have a bunch of poly operators, PJ, which you randomly pick. Say these are the number of poly operators. Then we take these projections, and my tilde here is now my approximate grade. If I do that, and I plot the complexity again, versus the black curve is the full gradient four for the chain, even though it was linear. Now, if we take linearly many poly operators, so we have linearly element, elements here, it gets like that, but the scaling gets better and better and better. Look, notice that for polynomially many, namely cube polys, we get pretty close. Okay, so the question is, how well can we approximate these things? And first, I want to show you that you can actually do that on a quantum computer. How do you do that? So first of all, you need to know what are these coefficients, right? Think of this as a vector. These are the coefficients of our vector. The first thing we do, we can measure these coefficients by taking the gradients with respect to theta k for all these pjs, right? First, we do say p1, the gradient, then we get the first coefficient, and so on and so forth. We measure all these coefficients, and then the next step is, how do you implement this step here? Well, for that, you could simply use Hamiltonian simulation technique. One technique we could use, you could just Colorize this evolution by implementing this linear combination through the trial theorem. But what I did, or what one of my students actually did, is instead of using trotter, which again increases the depth of the circuit, we use the so called Q drift protocol where we sample randomly these different directions and these different units. And it's very interesting because if you do that, you get a quantum channel like that. So just to guide you briefly to it. So the one, the lambda is basically the sum of all the coefficients so such that alpha j over lambda is a probability. So I assume that the alphas are all positive, noting that I can always absorb the sign and the p's. Then this is a bistochastic channel, whereas this is the probability that we implement these units. Notice that the depth of that doing that is one. We only need to implement one of these units, not as in Trotter, the whole sequence. Well, the average is then given by that map. Now, if you expand the exponential up to first order in lambda gamma, we obtain the full remaining grade. That's what you have done for two empty qubit I and chains. Here you see the quantum device data and the numerical simulation for two qubit system. Minus one is the ground state energy. And notice that we converge very nicely. The 
The red curve is the experimental data. Again, the average was just taken over five realizations. So it's still running. And I assume that that becomes better. However, for three qubits, you see, well, we followed nicely in the beginning, but then the circuits become too long and it meanders out into them. Uh, for the experts who, who work with Qiskit, I did not note you know, using any optimization techniques that are in, implemented in Qiskit because I, it's kind of cheating, right? You can, the optimization tools in Qiskit, which reduce the circuit depth, but then you cannot really argue with scale. Bottom line messages, though, that it works. And well, it works also for larger systems, but then the noise has. To be honest, I do not expect this be, to be a very, very useful algorithm for large scale problems. But what you see here is that we still go down. I can imagine this as a subroutine in a problem because it does not depend on the initial state. It works for random initials. That means if you use your favorite algorithm to get close to the solution, and then you change to this randomized approach, you still move. So I do not expect that we use this as a full algorithm, but potentially as a subroutine in other quantum simulation. Okay. Um, this, I feel like this is just the beginning of the story because in the end, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to learn the Riemannian gradient. I did that so far with relatively naive, relatively naive approach. I've randomly projected into directions. I started with one direction and then I took polynomially met. But in the end, we could probably use more sophisticated tools to learn the Riemannian gradient. For example, compressed sensing or shadow tomography, we just need to measure local observables to gain information about something much, much larger. Because again, we want to learn basically an approximation to a large vector. Uh, moreover, so far I argued, I have not really tailored that to the problem instance or to the device architecture. You could pick these HKs in a way that it takes the device connectivity into account, but also the problem structure. Tensor networks could be a nice approach for that too, to approximate these things. But these things are all, I would say, the future. Uh, with that, let me summarize. So I started the story basically with how I got into Riemann and gradient flows. And I argued that instead of fixing a circuit, you adaptively grow the circuit. And why do you do that? You minimize your cost. And how that is done is basically you start with unit transition here, and then you add another one in a way that while doing that, you move down. Um, basically, I showed that these, these adaptive quantum algorithms can be considered as variants of gradient flows by just projecting into a certain direction. And that is nice because the gradient flow, the full gradient flow, takes the problem structure into account. It respects the scaling, hopefully the complexity of the problem. I showed that you can implement these things efficiently with two designs, which is important for quantum device implementation. And I went on to argue, we, the goal is really to determine the most relevant direction. That is really the challenge here. How do we find out? How do we learn this large vector? What are the important components of this vector? Um, with this, I want to thank my team, particularly Maham, who's here, who as an engineer picked up fairly, really quickly this remaining grain flow business. When it comes to quantum mechanics, that's a different story. But, uh, I'm really, really happy that she's joined my team because she, she's really, really quick at filling that. And Arik, who is an undergrad, who implements these things on quantum. Um, I want to give a big thanks to my collaborators, Alicia McGann and Sophia Economy, particularly Alicia, who actually got me into the adaptive quantum algorithm business and who realized that rational quantum algorithms are nothing else than optimal control experiment. Uh, but last but not least, the three remaining Brain gurus, Emmanuel Beppe and Thomas Rupert Herbert, and Gunther here, particularly Emmanuel, because when I approached him um, and, I, and I told him this idea and how to prove these things, he immediately carried out the proof and uh, I, it, it turned out to be really nice. But, and last, the audience, because I think it was partly a bit technical and I hope I could excite you. For this. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much for the clear talk. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the assumption that you mentioned when you started talking about critical points. Uh, in our own project, we also found out that was the case. Uh, we call it dimensional expressivity, but it's counting the same number of dimensions that, um, 
that you use. And we saw that there were a lot of points that did not have maximal dimensions. Uh, very often, if you have rotational gates, uh, there will be a lot of points. But in our case, we, it was enough that we mentioned that it, they had to measure zero over the whole landscape. I saw that you used that method in the uh, convergence for the numerical method, but can the theoretical proof not also be saved by assuming that the the number of points where that's the case, where you don't have maximal dimension, also has measure zero? And if not, why not? Um, yes, yeah, so, so that, that's what I thought in the beginning too. Uh, if you, that might take forever because it was right at the beginning. I mean, you're making a good point because my intuition in the beginning was, where is this assumption? Um, it's right here. That the points, because it's very really strong, it has to hold every point theta in the optimization landscape, right? That is a really, really strong assumption. But you can argue, okay, how many points actually do exist that do not satisfy this assumption, right? And what it's fairly simple to show is that these points have measure zero. So if you randomly pick these theta, you will never hit these points. But that is, of course, not enough because you could still converge into these points. The fact that these points have measure zero does not mean that we do not converge in them. Okay? You can actually design an algorithm to find these points. So are they important when you numerically do that? You, if you have enough parameters, at least d squared minus one, you see that you do not hit them, yes. But I think you cannot use the measure zero argument because it doesn't mean that you randomly that, that you randomly sample these points and you never hit them, that you do not hit them if you use a gradient algorithm. Right? Can you get a gradient point? Yeah. Uh, you think you can have a case? I, so we proved it for two designs, right? We proved that the convergence result is for also for two design. Yeah. No, no, for both, for how random unitaries and two designs. Yeah. I thought in the beginning it's not possible to do that for two designs to prove that, but uh, Emmanuel proved me wrong. <laughs> yeah. One last question. These greedy circuits chasing a target are, of course, reminiscent of greedy control algorithms um, that we in, in pure theoretical um, world have. Uh, but um, actually, the very important, two important things here. Uh, one, of course, is Thomas must have pointed out that relaxation is present. And second, following on from Ronnie, the control noise. Yeah. Right? Every new gate. So would perhaps a better model there be not gradient descent in the tangent space, but the stochastic gradient descent of the kinds that machine learning people use that inevitably has a stochastic component that is added every time you add a gate to the chain? Yeah, so to, to you're making really, really good points. So first of all, when I showed the experimental data, you saw it at some point doesn't converge anymore, right? That is because of the noise. Now you have to distinguish between two types of noise coherent noise that enters in the unitary, that is not a problem because even though if you perturb it a bit, the fact that it doesn't depend on it, you still go down. Now, if you have noise that is not described by unitaries, by quantum channel, lin plot operator, or whatever, that is a problem um, because you can't fight against that, right? So to the first point, I see the fact that we use randomness. It has already a, a certain robustness to it against coherent error. Non-coherent errors is a problem. However, what I recently looked at, if you think of ancillary qubits, if you couple it to ancillary qubits to get the entropy out again, to some extent, do you can mitigate that too. But I think I wouldn't be surprised if you rediscover quantum error correction this way. <laughs> but yeah, you, you, so there's another point I want to make is that, that, that there's a lot of flexibility what kind of algorithm you use. We use really the base version here. Other updates might be better. So, Christian, at the end, you said um, you could maybe tailor this approach to the structure, like for tensor networks, but it's really a black box approach by design, right? You're supposed to be just adding one gate at a time. Yeah. And so, what do you really mean there? And then I have a comment. If you have to consider dynamic right? Yeah. If you could implement the full structure, you would. You saw that it's Well, you. I mean, it's a separate way. It shows a different case. Yes, but the example you showed, I mean, so actually the QMA 
I mean, the, the, the difficulty, the algorithmic difficulty of the ground state problem is QMA complete in the worst case. And so really what you want to be looking at is not the worst case. You want to be looking at an average case. But then your linear chain is basically a trivial case. Yeah. So you want to be somewhere in between. You want to discover the ones that are hard, uh, that, are, that yeah. are challenging. Not sure that it's possible. But my hope is to identify the bottom for which can efficiency. But, but why don't you... Why don't you look into the future? Why don't you just view the variational as an initial reasonably accurate state preparation and then apply acute quantum phase estimation on a fault tolerant machine? You still need to be sure, but you still need to talk close to the ground. Yes. Well, I need, for all physical problems, people typically would use some physical domain specific information. So you wouldn't be starting with a black box if it's physical. With max cut, it might be harder to. Developed the main, the main, the main question.